to the late book. Benjamin Whitrow reads the first of five ghost stories from the pen of M. R. James, Canon Albrecht's scrapbook. St. Bertrand de Comanche is a decayed town on the spurs of the Pyrenees, not very far from Toulouse. It was the site of a bishopric until the Revolution and has a cathedral that is visited by a certain number of tourists. In 1883, an Englishman arrived at this old world place, I can hardly dignify it with the name of a city, for there are not a thousand inhabitants. He was a Cambridge man, who had come specially to see St. Bertrand's Church, and had left two friends, who were less keen archaeologists than himself, in their hotel at Toulouse, under promise to join him on the following morning. Our Englishman, let us call him Deniston, had come early on the day in question and proposed to fill a notebook and to use several dozen plates in the process of describing and photographing every corner of the wonderful church that dominates the little hill of Comage. The verger was accordingly sent for, and when he came, the Englishman found him an unexpectedly interesting object of study. It was not in the personal appearance of the little dry, wizened old man, but in a curious, furtive, or rather hunted and oppressed air which he had. He was perpetually glancing behind him. The muscles of his back and shoulders seemed hunched in a continual nervous contraction, as if he were expecting every moment to find himself in the clutch of an enemy. The Englishman hardly knew whether to put him down as a man haunted by a fixed delusion, or as one oppressed by a guilty conscience, or as an unbearably henpecked husband. The probabilities, when reckoned up, certainly pointed to the last idea, but still the impression conveyed was that of a more formidable persecutor than even a termagant wife. As Deniston examined first the stalls, then the enormous dilapidated organ and objects in the treasure chamber, the sacristan kept on his heels the whole time, every now and then whipping round as if he'd been stung when one or other of the strange noises that trouble a large, empty building fell on his ear. Curious noises they were, too, sometimes. Once, Deniston said to me, I could have sworn I heard a thin, metallic voice laughing high up in the tower. I darted an inquiring look at my sacristan. He was white to the lips. It is he. That is, uh, it is no one. As the door is locked, was all he said, and we looked at each other for a full minute. Another little incident puzzled Deniston a good deal. He was examining a large, dark picture that hangs behind the altar, titled, How St. Bernard Delivered a Man Whom the Devil Long Sought to Strangle, when he noticed his companion on his knees, gazing at the picture with the eye of a suppliant in agony, his hands tightly clasped, and with a rain of tears on his cheeks. The man must be a monomaniac, the Englishman thought to himself. But what was his monomania? It was nearly five o'clock. The short day was drawing in, and the church began to fill with shadows. The sacristan began for the first time to show signs of hurry and impatience, so Deniston packed up his camera and notebook and proceeded to the door. On the doorstep, and for the first time that day, the two men fell into conversation. Monsieur seemed to interest himself in the old choir books in the sacristy. Uh, undoubtedly, I was going to ask you if there was a library in the town. No, monsieur. Here came a strange pause of irresolution, and then with a sort of plunge he went on, But if monsieur is amateur de vieux livre, I have at home something that might interest him. It is uh, but a hundred yards away. All at once, Deniston's cherished dreams of finding priceless manuscripts in untrodden corners of France flashed up. He would be foolish not to go. He would reproach himself for ever after if he refused. So they set off. Arriving on his doorstep, the sacristan paused a moment. Perhaps, he said, perhaps after all, Monsieur has not the time. Not at all, lots of time. Nothing to do till tomorrow. Let us see what it is that you've got. The door was opened at this point, and a face looked out. Plainly, it was the sacristan's daughter. She exchanged a few words with her father, of which Deniston caught only these, said by the old man. He was laughing in church. 
words which were answered only by a look of terror from the girl. But in another minute they were in the sitting room of the house, a small high chamber with a stone floor full of moving shadows cast by a wood fire that flickered on a great hearth. Something of the character of an oratory was imparted to it by a tall crucifix. The figure upon it was painted in natural colours. The cross itself was black. Under this stood a chest of some age and solidity, wherefrom the sacristan produced a large book wrapped in white cloth, on which a cross was rudely embroidered in red thread. The next moment the book was open, and Deniston felt he had at last lit on something better than good. Before him lay a large folio, bound perhaps in the late seventeenth century, with the arms of Canon Alberic de Mollion, stamped in gold on the sides. There may have been a hundred and fifty leaves of paper in the book, and on almost every one of them was fastened a leaf from an illuminated manuscript. Such a collection Deniston had hardly dreamed of in his wildest moments. Here were ten leaves from a copy of Genesis, illustrated with pictures which could not be later than A.D. 700. Further on was a complete set of pictures from a Psalter of English execution of the very finest the 13th century could produce. Deniston glanced up at the sacristan to see if his face yielded any hint that the book was for sale. He was pale. If Monsieur will turn on to the end. So Monsieur turned on, and at the end of the book he came across two sheets of paper of a more recent date than anything had yet seen. They must be contemporary, he decided, with the unprincipled Canon Alberic, who had doubtless plundered the chapter libraries and Bertrand to form this priceless scrapbook. On one sheet was a drawing representing a biblical theme, and on the right was a king on his throne, evidently King Solomon. On the pavement before him were grouped four soldiers surrounding a crouching figure, which I will describe in a moment. A fifth soldier lay dead on the pavement, his neck distorted, and his eyeballs starting from his head. The four surrounding guards were looking at the king, and in their faces the sentiment of horror was intensified. They seemed, in fact, only restrained from flight by their implicit trust in their master. All this terror was plainly excited by the being that crouched in their midst. At first you only saw a mass of coarse, matted black hair. Presently it was seen that this covered a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. The hands were hideously taloned. The eyes, touched in with a burning yellow, had intensely black pupils and were fixed upon the king with a look of beast-like hate. Deniston stole a look at his hosts. The sacristan's hands were pressed upon his eyes. His daughter was telling her beads feverishly. At last the question was asked, Is this book for sale? There was the same hesitation the same plunge of determination he had noticed before. And then came the welcome answer, If monsieur pleases. How much do you ask for it? I will take two hundred and fifty francs. My good man, Deniston said, your book is worth more, I assure you, far more. But the answer did not vary. There was really no possibility of refusing such a chance. The money was paid, a glass of wine drunk over the transaction, and Deniston made to leave, stepping out into the passage with the book under his arm. Here he was met by the daughter. Monsieur, she said, here is a silver crucifix and chain for the neck. Uh, would you perhaps be good enough to accept it? Uh, Deniston had much use for these things, but the request was unmistakably genuine, and he was reduced to profuse thanks. He then submitted to having the chain put round his neck. As he set off with his book, the sacristan and his daughter stood at the door looking after him, and were still looking when he waved them a last good night from the steps of his hotel. Dinner was over, and Deniston was in his bedroom, shut up alone with his acquisition. The landlady had manifested a particular interest in him since he had told her that he had paid a visit to the sacristan and bought an old book from him. He thought, too, 
that he had heard a hurried dialogue between her and the said sacristan in the passage outside the salle à manger, some words to the effect that Pierre and Bertrand would be sleeping in the house, had closed the conversation. He had taken the crucifix off and laid it on the table when his attention was caught by an object lying on the red cloth just by his left elbow. Two or three ideas of what it might be flitted through his brain with their own incalculable quickness. A pen wiper? No, no such thing in the house. A rat? No, too black. A large spider? Oh, I trust to goodness not. N no. Good God! A hand! A hand! Like the one in that picture! In another infinitesimal flash he had taken it in. Pale, dusty skin, covering nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength. Coarse black hairs, longer than ever grew on a human hand. Nails rising from the end of the fingers and curving sharply down and forward, grey, horny, and wrinkled. He flew out of his chair with inconceivable terror, clutching at his heart. The shape, whose left hand rested on the table, was rising to a standing posture behind his seat, its right hand crooked above its scalp. There was black and tattered drapery about it. The coarse hair covered it as in the drawing. The lower jaw was thin, shallow, like a beast's. Teeth showed behind the black lips. There was no nose. The eyes and the exulting hate and thirst to destroy life which shone there were the most horrifying features of the whole vision. There was intelligence of a kind in them. Intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man. Deniston grasped blindly at the crucifix, screamed, and, and then swooned. Pierre and Bertrand, the two serving men, rushed in but saw nothing. But they did feel themselves being thrust aside by something that passed out in between them. They sat up with Deniston for the remainder of the night, until his two friends arrived shortly after nine o'clock the following morning. The sacristan was also present and upon being told the story of the previous night's events, evinced no surprise. It is he, it is he, I have seen him myself twice, but I have felt his presence a thousand times. He would tell them nothing of the provenance of the book, nor any details of his experiences. I shall soon sleep, was all he would say, and my rest will be sweet. Why should you trouble me? He was to die the following summer. We shall never know what he or Canon Alberic de Molion suffered. At the back of the fateful drawing were some lines of writing which may be supposed to throw light on the situation. The dispute of Solomon with the demon of the night, drawn by Alberic de Molion. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. St. Bertrand, who put his devils to flight, pray for me most unhappy. I saw it first on the night of December the 12th, 1694. Soon I shall see it for the last time. I have sinned and have suffered, and have more to suffer yet. I have never quite understood what was Deniston's view of the events I have narrated. He quoted to me once a text from Ecclesiasticus. Some spirits there are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on sore strokes. On another occasion he said, Isaiah was a very sensible man. Doesn't he say something about night monsters living in the ruins of Babylon? These things are rather beyond us at present. The drawing was photographed and then burnt by Deniston on the day when he left Comminges on the occasion of his first visit. Benjamin Whitrow was reading Canon Alberic's scrapbook by M. R. James. The story was abridged and produced by Paul Kent.